How are you, Danny? You well? Friday afternoon it is. Hope all is well in your world. Lovely now it is. It was raining earlier on. Good bit of rain overnight and early this a.m., which was necessary. So dry has it been over the last uh, five, six weeks or so. Great to be with you this afternoon. I'm in good form. Got Philip Giraldi, former CIA officer, joining the programme this hour in about 25 minutes or thereabouts. But before that, there are some news headlines that I think you should know about and that I want to delve into a little bit. This is Friday's Richie Allen Show. Good to be with you. Asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on richieallen.co.uk. Fab Radio 2 in Manchester and TriggerWarning.tv Yeah, I didn't bother taking in the news at the top of the air because they're only going to play the same audio I'm going to play. You know? Marvellous. Let's do Friday. It's the Richie Allen Show. Broadcasting live on RichieAllen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. Yes, I am here. Thanks for joining me. And as usual, you can tweet me. My Twitter handle is at Richie Allen Show. Couldn't be easier. Send me a tweet. I'll see it. I enjoy hearing from you during the live program. This program, of course, in lieu of the fact that I was absent in the midweek as I was entertaining here in this great city. Right, so much to get through. Philip Giraldi, great guy. It's been quite a while since Philip was on the programme. Today is only Friday the 13th. Do you remember that? <laughs> How were we ever scared of films like that, eh? You could show that to a five-year-old now and they'd laugh at it. Friday, Friday the 13th. Marvellous. Which, if I remember correctly, Kevin Bacon was in. Was he? Was that his big screen debut, Kevin Bacon? Maybe he was, yeah. I was uh, terrified by that stuff when I was younger. Show it to a child now, they'll laugh at you. <laughs> I suppose. I suppose they would. Right, it is the 13th. Not easy for me to say. Obviously, the UK news today is full of the Trump-May meeting at Chequers and Trump's meeting with the Queen this afternoon. That's about it, really. In terms of what's being covered anyway, I won't labour the point. You know what I think about how the media operates here, how it does it and why it does it. Um, so Trump and May held a joint press conference about an hour ago at Chequers, the Prime Minister's residence, country residence. The highlights were when they were asked about Russia migration and about Brexit. So I've got the brief highlights here for you. Donald Trump, the US president, was asked about his plans for his meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin. He's meeting Putin in Helsinki. Helsinki even. <laughs> oh my God, it's Friday. He's meeting him in Helsinki this coming Monday. What were or what are his plans for that meeting he was asked by one of the assembled press corps. I'll be meeting with President Putin on Monday. Uh, we go into the meeting with a tremendous meeting that we had with NATO. Most of you have reported it correctly. So we go in strong. Uh, we'll be talking to President Putin about a number of things. Ukraine. We'll be talking about Syria. We'll be talking about uh, other parts of the Middle East. I will be talking about nuclear proliferation. <laughs> Because we are massively, you know, you know what we've been doing. We've been modernizing and fixing and buying. And uh, it's just a devastating technology. Uh, and they likewise are doing a lot. And it's a very, very uh, bad policy. We have no choice. But uh, we are massively big and they are very big. <laughs> Trump talks a lot of monumental old bollocks, doesn't he? We are massively big and they are big, he says. Waffling on. They might have had a few drinks over the lunch, maybe. Very big. And I'll be talking about nuclear proliferation. That would be a great thing if we could do. Now, it's not only us. It's not only Russia and the United States. It's other countries also. But we're the two leaders. We would be the leader. They would be second. I guess China would be third. I think we'll all be talking What's about he talking that. About? I, to me, Jonathan, I think that would be a tremendous 
uh, it would be a tremendous achievement if we could do something on nuclear proliferation. And we'll be talking about other things. I know you'll ask, uh, will we be talking about meddling? And uh, I will absolutely bring that up. I don't think you'll have any, uh, gee, I did it, I did it, you got me. There won't be a Perry Mason here, I don't think. But you never know what happens, right? But I will absolutely, firmly ask the question. Yeah, he'll be asking the question about meddling to Putin. He won't, of course. We'll be talking with Philip Giraldi about about that and US-Russian relations later this hour, in a few minutes, actually. Trump was then asked about migration and comments that he made earlier this week that migration has negative impacts on national cultures. Now, of course, mass migration does, of course, have an impact, negative and otherwise, on indigenous cultures. That's something I would agree with. What does he say about it anyway? Trump, here he is. I think it's been very bad for Europe. I think uh, Europe is a place I know very well, and I think that uh, what has happened is very tough. It's a very tough situation. I mean, you see the same terror attacks that I do. We see them a lot. Uh, we just left some incredible young men, men and women at Sandhurst, and they were showing us cells, and they were showing us things that, frankly, 20 years ago nobody even thought about, probably a lot more recently than that nobody even thought about. I, I just think it's uh, changing the culture. I think it's a very negative thing for Europe. I think it's very negative. I think having... Uh, Germany and I have a great relationship with Angela Merkel great relationship of Germany but I think that's uh, very much hurt Germany I think it's very much hurt other parts of Europe and I know it's politically not necessarily correct to say that but I'll say it and I'll say it loud and I think they better watch themselves because you are changing culture, you are changing a lot of things, you're changing security, you're cha look at what's happening. I mean, you take a look. I mean, look at what's happening to different countries that never had difficulty, never had problems. It's a very sad situation. It's very unfortunate. But I do not think it's good for Europe and I don't think it's good for our country. Wow. Fake socialist pro pretender Owen Jones must be losing his shit when he hears Trump say those things. Same question to Theresa May then. What do you think immigration, what sort of impact has it had on national cultures in the UK, culture in the UK and elsewhere? Theresa May. The UK has a proud history of welcoming people who are fleeing persecution to our country. We have a proud history of welcoming people who want to come to our country to contribute to our economy and contribute to our society. And over the years, overall immigration has been good for the UK. It's brought people with different backgrounds, different outlooks here to the UK, and, has, uh, and we've seen them contributing to our society and to our economy. Of course, what is important is that we have control of our borders. What is important is that we have a set of rules that enables us to determine who comes in to our country and of course that is what uh, as a government we have been doing for a number of years and we'll be able to continue to do in the future. Well she's a lawyer they haven't been doing that at all for a number of years. They set migration targets, net migration targets and consistently failed to meet them and there's no guarantees in this white paper she's published that they will take or the UK will take full control over who comes into the UK when and how She's a liar, of course. Now, May was asked, Theresa May was asked, why does she keep saying that her Brexit white paper will be a clean break from the EU when it clearly isn't? And that Brexiteers keep saying it's actually worse than staying in the EU. So why does she keep harping on about it being a great thing Theresa May. Well, first of all, on the uh, on the, the issue of trade deals, as I've said earlier, what we're, we're negotiating and when we come out of the negotiations, I want to see and we will have our ability to have independent trade policy, to set our own tariffs, to be that independent member of the WTO, to be able to negotiate trade deals around the world as we uh, will be doing. And we're looking at, obviously, at the United States, we're looking at other areas as well, as we've said. We're looking at uh, issues like uh, the, the uh, possibility of some trade deals around the Pacific, uh, Pacific area too. Uh, we will negotiate those trade deals, but I also want to have a good trade arrangement with the European Union. This isn't an either-or. We don't 
just replace one with the other. Actually, the United Kingdom is looking for and can negotiate a situation where we can have a good trade relationship with the European Union, a great trade relationship, a good trade relationship with the United States and around the rest of the world as well. And that is what will be good for jobs, good for people's livelihoods, good for prosperity here in the UK. She completely ignored the question. I didn't play you the journalist question to save time, but the journalist asked specifically, why do you keep saying that the Brexit white paper will be a clean break from the European Union when it clearly isn't? She sidestepped it because she can't stand over it. It ain't a clean break. So Donald Trump was asked what would he do? The Sun newspaper interviewed Trump in Brussels during the week. They put the video online and in the video Trump says that if the UK doesn't properly leave the European Union then it couldn't do a trade deal with the United States of America. Trump also said that he gave advice to May on how to deal with the EU negotiators. So it was put to him at this press conference at Chequers, in her place, what would you do in terms of a deal? One of the reasons I got elected was because of immigration and I felt that Brexit had the upper hand and most people didn't agree with me. If you remember, Barack Obama said, well, that your country will have to get on the back of the line if that happened, which I thought was a terrible thing to say, frankly. But I said I thought it was going to happen, and it did happen. And I also think uh, that as far as negotiating the deal, I probably would have done what my suggestion was to the prime minister, but my but she could what always do that. What did you say? That. What did you say? She can do that. At some point, she can do what I suggested to her. No, well, you can't walk away, because if she walks away, that means she's, she's stuck. Yeah, what a fucking idiot Trump is, huh? All these idiot supporters around the world who believe that this guy is uh, rooting out the deep state, eh? Taking on the swamp. He's nothing but a Rothschild Zionist whore. She can't walk away, says Trump. What a bullshitter. Of course she can walk away and defer to World Trade Organization uh, most favourable nation trading terms. Of course she can. There's Trump summed up in a nutshell right there. A useless frontman. A Philip Green from the film Casino. That's all he is. Mr. Philip Green wanted to believe that the Teamsters gave him all that money to buy the casino for himself. He was just a frontman. The real bosses are in the shadows. What a fool Trump is. You can't walk away. Uh, but you can do other things. But uh, I, she can do... What my suggestion was. What was my, your suggestion? My suggestion was, you know, respectfully submitted. Uh, she will, uh, she will do very well. I think she's a very tough negotiator. I've been watching her over the last couple of days. Yeah, what an idiot Trump is. Anyway, we'll move on. That was, or those were the highlights from that press conference at Checkers. Anyway, it's Friday's show, thirteenth of July, two thousand and eighteen. It's exactly thirteen minutes past four. UK time, British summer time, and boy, have we had a summer this year. It's been great. As I chat with you, Philip Giraldi has just uh, stepped in. So we'll have Philip on in a few minutes' time. He's got, he's going to dig down into some of these things that Trump might be negotiating or discussing with Vladimir Putin next week. We'll talk about the Novichok nonsense with Philip as well, of course. Former CIA officer. Lots to get into with him. So it's a mad day then because... All you're getting across the UK media is this. So after the Checkers meeting and the the press conference, last night Trump was at dinner with May. Today, breakfast, lunch, then the press conference. Now he's off to see the Queen. And as I speak with you, I think he might be there now. Blanket coverage by Sky News and their telethon specialist, Kay Burley. There's no building or street corner is that Burley won't haunt for 24 hours talking bollocks to a camera. She is a genius, is the ginger ninja. And there's nothing more mundane for a reporter than trying to make Trump's visit to the Queen sound newsworthy. But nobody creates a sense of occasion just like our Kay. She's with Alistair Bruce, who's Sky's royal correspondent, Dear listener, prepare yourself for hard-hitting journalism. Talk us through what happens when they have a cup of tea. Well, they'll go to... <laughs> Let's just start off again. Let's start that again. Talk us through what happens when they have a cup of tea. When they have a cup of tea. Well, they'll go to one of the rooms <laughs> that the Queen uses most frequently. Wow. 
and she's basically on the first principal floor. First principal floor? Fuck, this is great. Above the area that we will see the parade taking place. Above where the parade is? Christ, are you writing this down, dear listener? This is serious shit, this, right? What have we got so far? Above the parade area, uh, the Queen, uh, first floor, right? This is fucking, this is dynamite. And in there will be a very comfortable uh, arrangement. What? A very comfortable arrangement? Who'd have believed it? Teapot ready to go. Teapot ready to go! Uh, boiling water. Boiling fucking water! I can't take any more! Water, and uh, she'll get the tea out of the caddy. She'll get the tea out of the caddy! What next? The tea herself. Uh, pour the tea for the president and the first lady, and they'll have a chat. And the They'll have a chat! What will they talk about, Alistair? And there'll be dogs around. There'll be dogs! Fuck, this is amazing! I wish I was there! And, and I'm sure it'll be a perfectly different kind of experience for President Trump from anything else that he has experienced while he's been in the I United want to Kingdom. I so much more about it. Is it builder's tea? Is it builder's tea? Oh, what a question! What a journalist, what a presenter! That's what I was thinking. I bet that's what you were thinking, dear listener. Is it builder's tea? Okay. Uh, well, no, I think it's a very carefully made Twinings perfection. <laughs> Twinings! Fuck! I was hoping it was builders, but it's twinings they're gonna have. <laughs> and do they have sandwiches with the crust cut off? Yes. What a question! Kay Burley, give her the Pulitzer. If they have sandwiches, will they cut the fucking crusts off? Will they? Off. Yes. Yes! <laughs> yes! Yes! Oh, this is great stuff, this. Wow! Thank fuck for journalism. Yeah, there's cucumber ones and all sorts of Not necessarily. Like could Not necessarily cucumber ones. <sighs> Christ, what, what could be in the sandwiches? Be anything, really. I mean, you know, it could be... A anything! Anything, really! It could be anything. It could be corned beef. It could be spam. The Queen likes a bit of spam. It could be a paste. It could be... I mean, basically, the traditional things that have regularly been used in the period when the Queen was much younger and she keeps them going. OK, and how long is he likely to be in there for? Well... Milani will be there too, I think. Yeah, I mean, tea takes the time tea takes. Um tea takes the time tea takes. Profound stuff from Alistair Bruce there. Oh, great. brilliant journalism, that. And that's exactly why I'm stuck here in this uh, studio in Manchester. And, and that's why I'm not on commercial radio anymore or why I'm not on national television. I just can't hold a fucking candle to Cape Hurley. That's outstanding stuff, that. Absolutely brilliant. Fuck me sideways, eh? <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. I bet it'll be green tea served by the Queen, of course. Boom, boom, boom. It'll be green. <laughs> What's that? Did you have a drink before coming on the air today? No, I did not. Of course not. Okay, the gift that keeps on giving. <clears throat> Here's the story I saw today. It's Friday. Let's lighten the mood before the wonderful Philip Giraldi joins us live from his home. Families ordered to remove pool in case burglar drowns in strewed inflatable. I, when you, re you read that headline and you think, it's got to be bullshit that. Even in this crazy world, it's got to be lies. Fuming neighbours have been told to take down their paddling pool in case a burglar falls into it and drowns. <laughs> it's true. Maria Young and her neighbours, who live in the same block of flats, clubbed together and bought the 12-foot pool and cover for 64 quid for their communal garden. But the landlord company MHS Homes has told them to take it down or empty it out each night for health and safety, despite it having nothing to do with the health and safety executive. Maria said a team of them came and said initially we'd have to get rid of it. They then changed their mind and said we had to put it down each night for health and safety issues. They said if someone breaks in, they might drown in the pool. Jesus Christ. I'd be, if I was Maria now, I'd be standing there in front of the team of elf and safety people and I'd be nodding along and I'd be saying yeah 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 and I'd be silently motioning to Caroline to hand me my baseball bat which I would fucking break off their skulls empty a pool in case a burglar drowns in it <laughs> what the fuck <laughs> ah madness madness and finally for the moment a more serious story I want to give a nod to Jim Corr we all know Jim. We all follow Jim on Facebook and on and Twitter. And I've, I've interviewed Jim a few times over the years. And we are in touch occasionally because we're interested in the same things. 
Jim, um, he's a good guy, Jim, very good guy. He sent me this, a story in the Irish Times today. The headline is, State should stop fighting fighting vaccine cases and give compensation, TD says. State should stop fighting vaccine cases and give compensation, TD says. A call has been made for the government to stop fighting court cases against people affected by a vaccine the state offered for swine flu. Fianna Fáil TD, that's Chuck Dodola, that's a member of Parliament. Fianna Fáil TD Mark McSharry alleged in the Doyle that the state claims agency has spent €2 million Euro rigorously defending discovery alone in cases. A number of children and young adults who received the vaccine have experienced life-altering illnesses, said the TD. Some have taken legal action, uh, alleging they suffer narcolepsy. Others are desperately awaiting state assistance and compensation commensurate with those uh, life-altering illnesses. This is great stuff, this, by that Fianna Fáil Member of Parliament. Thanks to Jim... um, Jim Carr, of course, for sending me that story, or, or not sending it to me, but putting it out there on Twitter where I saw it. Do you know, I think the dam is going to break with these vaccine, these vaccines that have caused injuries. You know, the more obvious ones where you can prove obvious injury. And I think for, for, for the women of regret in Ireland whom have been affected by a different vaccine and their daughters, I think this is good news. And it's not good news for the pharmaceutical companies. And I hope other members of Parliament, TDs, Chuck the Jawless in the Republic of Ireland, will jump in and support that TD in his campaign to uh, force the government to start paying compensation to those affected by that swine flu vaccine. Because the proof is in the pudding. And Jim Corr, to his absolute credit, was vilified in Ireland when on national television some years ago, Jim talked about that particular vaccine being dangerous and he was mocked and ridiculed on national TV and he's being vindicated today. He didn't need to be vindicated, not in my eyes or the eyes of my uh, listeners anyway, but fair play to Jim, top man Jim Corr. I'd like to get Jim back on the programme again in the near future. It'd be great to have him on. Going to take a very quick break. When we come back from it, I will be joined by Robert... um, uh, not Robert, what's wrong with me? Philip Giraldi, of course. Philip Giraldi, legendary CIA officer, journalist, writer and human rights activist, joins me in a minute. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others, become part of this ever-growing world wide family of unique pure energy healing practitioners discover how amazing you truly are go to www.markbayerski.com it could just change your life forever forever Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. Welcome back to the most listened to independent radio show in Europe. It's your Richie Allen Show. Welcome back to the program. I want to say a big hi to Larry Jazz, an old friend of mine from the Costa del Sol. Terrific DJ and presenter in his own right. Lovely to hear that you're listening in, Larry. Great to be with you. Live right now on Fab Radio across the great city of Manchester. Triggerwarning.tv, TuneIn Radio and RichieAllen.co.uk. My guest this hour needs little introduction. He's been on the programme before. 
He's a remarkable man. Very fond of him and um, very impressed with the work he's been doing uh, since I've known him and been reading him. He is a former CIA officer and the executive director of the Council for the National Interest. Great writer as well. And I will tweet out links to where you can read his daily articles. Let's welcome back to the show. Very busy man today, uh, Philip Giraldi. Phil, welcome back, sir. How are you? Oh, I'm fine, Richie. How about you? I'm very well, sir. It's been a great summer here. You've you've probably seen that sweltering in the UK over the last few weeks. We're very unused to that, but it's um, no, all is good. Thanks for giving us your time. I know it's in uh, great demand. Have you been following the Trump visit to the UK and and the European Union, and of course his meeting with the NATO countries this week? Of course, you've been following it. What have you made of it so far? Well, it's. Uh... <laughs> There is some contradictory material coming out, uh, particularly in the uh, in the visit to the UK. I think uh, uh, on one hand, you know, he's dropping Theresa May into the boiling pot, and then uh, with the other hand, he's pulling her out. Um, Trump is, uh, you know, Trump is into uh, shock politics, and and I think that's very much showing here. The uh, uh, the, the previous stop with NATO uh, exhibited the same sort of thing, where he essentially was virtually calling for the U.S. to pull out of NATO um, uh, unless NATO got its act together. And then he came out with statements at the end praising the alliance and uh, saying that everyone agreed to increase their spending, which they, of course, had not done. So we're, we're seeing a lot of things going on. Uh, but the most important stop, of course, will be um, when he sits down in Helsinki and talks to uh, Vladimir Putin. That's the one I'm waiting to hear. Absolutely. And we're going to talk about that in a second And because there's so many issues on the table there. This Wiltshire Salisbury latest incident, which is bizarre. Uh, Phil, I can only imagine what you think about that. We'll talk about that in a second. Obviously, of course, Syria and, and, and you know, alleged Russian meddling and all of that. One interesting thing said in the press conference at Chequers today Trump said in response to a journalist's question, would, should May walk away from speaking with the European Union? And he said, no, she can't do that. She's stuck. To me, and my opinion is very well known, at least amongst my listeners anyway, of course she can walk away rather than deal with what, what seems to be a fascist dictatorship, kind of tyrannical attitude of the EU. Very surprising to hear him, Philip, say she's stuck, she can't walk away. Or is this just more bluster from Trump? I don't think it's so much bluster as ignorance. I, I think he doesn't realize how complex uh, the relationship between the UK and the European Union has become as a result of uh, uh, how many years now is it of, of togetherness? Uh, yeah. uh, going on 50 years? Is it that long? I'm, I'm, yeah, do you, uh, but yeah you're right. You're nearly right. Yeah, spot on. Go ahead. Sorry, Philip. You're spot on yeah. pretty much. Yeah, the point is, it's it's uh, the 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 divorce is 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 complicated. Uh, I think what May is trying to do uh, is salvage uh, the ability to do business with the EU uh, without having to pay much of a price. And of course, I think that's a that's a, probably an illusion on her part. Um, Trump seems to, uh, uh, with his relationship with Boris Johnson, be saying that. Um, a hard break would have been the best way to pursue this because you'll have a better relationship with the United States. Uh, that might be a bit of an illusion too. Trump can't necessarily um, create trade where trade doesn't exist. And and currently, I believe it's correct to say that the Britain and the United States are pretty much even on trade. Uh, so I, I don't know suddenly where, where Trump is going to find this um, extra uh, benefit to give to Britain. So yeah. it's... it's um, uh, a lot of it is ignorance on the part of Trump. I don't think he sees the depth uh, of reality in terms of relationships. Uh, many, of course, um, like yourself, like myself, uh, uh, and hardliners in the Tory party would like to see a more decisive break because I, I agree with you that the European Union um, is becoming an unmanageable, or has long been an unmanageable entity that, if anything, diminishes the, the liberty of the countries that are engaged in it. Well said, Philip. Just before we talk about uh, Putin, I was thinking of you as I was watching the press conference. Obviously, I was thinking of you because you were coming on with me today. And Trump said that migration has, you know, it, it has a serious impact on culture in countries, on, you know, indigenous culture or, or national cultures, 
Right, fair enough. And I thought of you, I thought, wouldn't it be great to have one journalist sitting there to put their hand up and say, but Mr. President, isn't it the policy of your government and previous governments destabilising countries like Libya and Syria and Afghanistan, bombing these countries back to the Stone Age that results in people having to flee those countries? Philip, do you pray some days that one member of the press corps will have the courage to stand up and say, what are you talking about, man? Well, the problem with the press corps is it's been co-opted and essentially uh, these people don't want to lose their jobs. Mm. Um, yeah, I agree with you. Absolutely. I, I think that the uh, the United States, uh, more than Europe, uh, much more than Europe, has a, has a direct responsibility to uh, pick up the pieces in these places that it's... Uh, that it's destroyed, and I, you know you can name a, a number of countries in the Middle East that uh, you mentioned some of them, uh, but also uh, one forgets about Latin America that um, uh, wars on drugs and wars on uh, on communism and wars on uh, what you perceive as terrorism has um, has brought about uh, dictatorships in a number of these countries and uh, destroyed their economies. Uh, I wrote an article uh, that appeared yesterday about uh, how uh, Trump has uh, blithely in a meeting about a year ago was talking about uh, invading Venezuela to straighten out their democracy. I mean, is this kind of mindset and, and, and what do you do with the pieces after you straighten them out? And he's basically saying, well, you can't come here. <laughs> it's incredible, isn't it? It's incredible yeah. to, to, to witness this and, and to have to put up with the daily broadcasts from Sky and CNN and Fox not dealing with this stuff. And I suppose it's left to the independent media. Um, I'm tweeting out links to where people can read you, Philip, as we go along. Philip Giraldi is our guest, honorable, honorable man, uh, introduced to Phil um, just over a year ago by uh, our friend Ray McGovern, who's um, been working with Phil, Philip for many, many years. So he's off to Helsinki on on Monday. One of the things Donald Trump said this afternoon that he would be bringing up was meddling. Philip, this meddling thing, why has this not gone away? I, I, I'm as honest as I can possibly be. And when I'm proven wrong, I'll, I'll be the first to put my hand up and say, I, I, I broadcast something, it turned out to be wrong. There isn't a shred of evidence that the Russian government, the Kremlin, had anything to do with the attempting anyway to influence or sway the last US presidential election, no more than any newspaper would or any television news channel would anyway. Do you think he really will be bringing up meddling with Putin or is that just more bluster from Donald? Well, I think I, th I think he has to bring up meddling because there's a demand to hear that he did so from his constituency and also the general public in the United States. I agree with you absolutely that there hasn't been one shred of evidence on this. Uh, and as a former intelligence officer, I assure you that the United States and Britain and any number of other countries that have the capabilities do this kind of thing all the time. They're, they probe into government systems. They look for vulnerabilities. They do this kind. That's what intelligence or what spying is all about. That doesn't necessarily mean that someone has a coordinated plan to influence an election or overthrow a government, and I think it, certainly in this case, after all the all the uh, the investigation that's been going on, with nothing coming out of this, uh, the the possibility that Russia had such a plan or had such a coordinated effort, I think, is is zero. Absolutely zero, and yet they persist with it, not just in your country, Philip, but over here as well. They keep digging it up and dragging it out time and time and time again without offering any mitigating evidence where, you know, a journalist like myself could say, OK, you've got something, it's nonsense, to suggest that Russia was involved in trying to influence the French general election and everything else. It's absolutely crazy. So Trump will, because he's under pressure from the media here and obviously in, in his own country, he will have to be seen to bring it up. I wonder what sort of conversations they'll have privately, Philip, in relation to that. You know, I mean, they, they, they will say things in front of the media, but privately it'll be a different thing, I'm guessing. Yeah, I think they will. They will agree that there are certain um, issues that uh, it has to be accepted that there's one point of view from Washington and another point of view from Moscow. And certainly, the issue of Crimea will be in that category. The uh, the issue of Ukraine in general, 
uh, and uh, the probing and the uh, the possible um, uh, influencing operation by the Russians will also kind of be in that category. Trump will say, gee, my people think that you did it. And uh, Putin will say, gee, we didn't. And we were not planning on doing it in the future. So we'll just have to be sort of, you know, some some kind of a middle ground where it's accepted that uh, uh, both sides may have a kernel of truth in what they're saying and uh, essentially will understand that any kind of overt um, interference in elections or anything like that, something that's demonstrable, uh, certainly is not going to be acceptable. Philip Giraldi is our guest. We've got Philip for another 15 minutes or thereabouts. He's off then to do other work today. Uh, Philip is the Executive Director of the Council for the National Interest and a a distinguished former CIA officer and his writings, and I've already tweeted out links to where you can find his writings on our Twitter handle. His articles are absolutely terrific. Philip, this Novichok thing in Salisbury and Wiltshire, I mean, I spent years in commercial media. And maybe my brain has gone a bit soft in terms of maybe I I like to think, you know, maybe I have rose-tinted spectacles. I think that even back in my days as a mainstream national and commercial radio presenter, that even I, even then, under pressure, that I couldn't stand over reading out some of these stories about this Novichok in wheelchair and it's, it was left on a door and, and then this this new couple found it and the woman has died and now they're telling us that it has a shelf life of 50 years and people could run into it. I've never ever in my life read or come across such horse manure in all my life. You're an intelligence expert, Philip. How could anybody be expected to believe these stories coming out of the UK media? Well, you know, it's a, it's a question of the backstory, I think, uh, which you, you're, I'm sure, more than familiar yeah. with in your own experience. The backstory is that uh, Theresa May was in trouble politically, uh, and this, uh, this poisoning came as a, uh, as, a, as a wonderful surprise for her. Uh, she essentially found a major enemy that she was able to stand up to, the major enemy being uh, Vladimir Putin, and, um, and this whole story was concocted. Uh, none of it makes any sense. None of it made any sense right from the beginning in terms of what the possible Russian motives would be and why they would pick that timing, which was particularly uh, damaging to them. Uh, And now, of course, we have the second case uh, with someone dying. And um, the the last thing I saw on it, I think it was yesterday, was that the British uh, police are saying they obviously came into contact with some objects that were uh, somehow... uh, uh, tainted with uh, with the um, nerve agent, and uh, yet they can't seem to find these objects that somehow they came into contact with uh, that uh, killed one of them and uh, has um, gravely hurt the other. So I think it's all bullshit. Um, I, I, <laughs> Too <I>, right. <laughs> yeah, Port Down is only seven miles away from yeah. Salisbury and seven miles away from Amesbury with the late, where the latest attack took place. Um, and um, if I were looking for a source for uh, <laughs> this, for that nerve agent or any other nerve agent, uh, I might want to be looking there. Folks, you're listening to, you know, a vastly experienced investigator. They're telling you the truth. This is a crazy story. Could, um, this, what's his first name? Skripal. Sergei Skripal. Could he, of course this is fantasy and I know you can't answer this, but we can speculate for for, for the crack, as we say in, in Ireland. Could Sergei Skripal still be working for the British government? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean it's possible. I, I, I think a lot of these things, um, uh, they, they get, they get um, transformed, shall we say. Yeah. He, he probably is working as uh, um, a consultant that is called upon occasionally and he gets a small salary to keep him keep him mellow uh, or it might be more active than that there's certainly been uh, speculation that he was uh, involved in the Trump dossier um and there's been other speculation about him um but even there i mean again what is the russian motive uh what are they going to get or accomplish by going after this guy in a very uh, transparent way using a nerve agent that, uh, if they had actually done it, would have been identified as Russian source. I mean, 
wouldn't wouldn't they have been clever enough to use yeah. a nerve agent that wasn't sourced to Russia if it really was the Russians who were doing this? I mean, the whole again, the whole story you, you it's like a cat chasing its tail. You're going around and around and around, and you're always coming back to the same conclusion that none of this makes sense. It's re- the, the media is really asking us to suspend our disbelief here, Philip. More than I think in recent time, more more than any other any other issue. Are you impressed with Putin? I ask that question because, again, you, you, your instinct as an investigator is to ask who benefits. There was nothing in it for the Russians to do that to uh, Sergei Skripal and his daughter, particularly in World Cup year. And I'll tell you something, Philip, just before the World Cup, I was fairly disgusted with the BBC. I, I'm regularly disgusted with the BBC, but they had John Sweeney, one of their most famous... Uh, presenters, he presents Panorama and Sweeney was on national, he, he was on the BBC's national um, uh, news channel saying that people shouldn't go to Russia for the World Cup they shouldn't go there, don't go because, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a police state and they'll be out looking for, you know, English fans they'll be out looking to make life all this complete nonsense and none of this was challenged by any of the presenters what an amazing World Cup it's been it's been fantastic. It's great to see English football fans sending back these reports that it's a wonderful open country. The people are lovely. The food is great. The accommodation is brilliant. Everything is great. How embarrassing that the English team did well and none of the UK dignitaries were there to be seen, you know, to, to, to meet with the Russian counterparts. You've got to be kind of impressed with the way Putin has conducted himself throughout this whole poisoning story and the World Cup. I think he's doing very well. What do you think, Phil? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I was in St. Petersburg back about six weeks ago. Um, and uh, uh, I've been to Moscow before. And uh, I've always found the um, the Russian people of today, we're not talking about the Soviet Union, uh, hospitable, friendly. Uh, if you go to a hotel, the service is good. The food is good. Uh uh, there's a lot to see. There's a lot to do. I have a very favorable impression of Russia and of the Russians. And um, there were similar warnings here in the United States telling um, uh, soccer fans, football fans, uh, that uh, be careful about going to Russia. You know, the uh, it's it's not a good place and so on and so forth. It was the same sort of thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I find this disgraceful because I think that the... Uh, the Russians have uh, uh, comported themselves extremely well, as has Vladimir Putin. Uh, he's a respectful, dignified personality, uh, and he says the right things. Um, so I, I, I find this um, objectionable. I think we should uh, be working very hard with the Russians to show mutual respect and uh, to work ways to, uh, to d- develop uh, the kinds of contacts that... Uh, Basically, once and for all, end the Cold War. We don't need another replay of the Cold War. Absolutely not. Philip Giraldi is our guest. We've got Philip for another seven, eight minutes till around about ten to the top of the hour. And um, I want to get into this. Uh, Philip, I have to say this, and it's not in any way, you know, blowing smoke at you. The Your articles over the last um, few years, particularly on Syria, uh, you know, your work on exposing the dark actors working in Syria and everything else. It's brilliant stuff. It's really, really great stuff. And I can't recommend it highly enough for people. Of course, Trump will be speaking to Vladimir Putin about Syria. Maybe Trump will be heavily influenced by his um, friends in, in Israel in terms of what he, he says. I, I don't know. We'll have to, to wait and see. But it's been off the news for a while, Syria. And I understand you and I have some of the, we have some of the same friends in the independent media. It looks like the the Assad government, the righteous government of Syria, Bashar al-Assad, they've done really, really well with the backing of Russia, obviously. And I understand, Philip, correct me if I'm wrong here, but they've basically, they're at the point now of, um, you know, total victory over these lunatic jihadists that were sent in from Saudi Arabia and elsewhere, trained, of course, and armed by um, our countries. They're on the verge of basically winning that, aren't they, the Syrians? Yeah, that's right. I think that uh, essentially there there is going to be some uh, uh, continued fighting in certain areas. Uh, there are problems in terms of uh, uh, Turkish perceptions along the northern border. Uh, the United States is um, clearly um, uh, concerned and wants to maintain a foothold 
down in the southeastern corner, you know, where Iraq and Jordan and uh, and Israel come together with with Syria. Uh, Israel, of course, is meddling in the thing. It, it staged an attack yesterday on Syrian army units and has been doing this sort of thing to provoke a reaction from the Ira Iranians. So it's a, it's still a bit of a mess, but certainly uh, al-Assad has the uh, upper hand, which I think is a good thing. Uh, uh, the Syrian people would welcome a return to some measure of normalcy. It would be the humane thing to do to let that happen. And uh, I, I'm, I'm all in, say, in favor of, uh, of supporting what the Russians and the Iranians have been doing to help al-Assad. Uh, and I think the United States should accelerate its plans to, to leave the country completely. And it seems that Trump might be thinking that same way. Yeah, it's brilliant, isn't it? I, I saw I, the most recent interview with Bashar al-Assad on Russian television, Russian, Russia TV, RT, was, was several weeks ago. And he, he, he comes across brilliantly as sad. Now, those of us real journalists like yourself, um, we, we knew all about Bashar al-Assad um, before all of this um, lunacy happened. And he was always a very mild-mannered guy. Of course, he was a reluctant president. He got the job because his brother, who was the heir apparent, of course, died. Very softly spoken man, a medical man, a doctor. I thought it was interesting, Philip, that he, he took a very firm line when asked by the presenter about the American presence in the country. And he said, without missing a beat or blinking an eye, he said, they will leave after we've dealt with the jihadists. And... I thought, you know, first of all, I thought, great, you know, fair, fair dues for, for saying that. Um, you wouldn't be worried about any conflict between the U.S. presence there and the Syrians directly that might escalate. That wouldn't worry, you know. Well, it, uh, yeah, it would worry me. Uh, there have been several provocations uh, carried out by the U.S. and Israel in terms of uh, uh, targeting, admittedly, mostly the Iranian or what they claim to be Iranian targets. Although the one yesterday, there were Syrian army units, apparently. The, uh, uh, yeah, so it does worry me, but I think he's right. And, uh, and I think that uh, uh, anyone who in, in Washington who is seriously thinking about the issue understands that the game is over. Uh, the question is, will the United States have a seat at the table even as discussions in, in terms of a final settlement of, uh, of the problem uh, proceed. And so I think that's essentially what the United States is playing for right now, to ma maintain some kind of minimal presence and also be able to uh, contribute to the conversation. Uh, so anyway, we will, we will see how it plays out. But I think this is one of the things that uh, Trump will definitely be talking with Putin about. And it'd be interesting to see how that how that develops. Won't it? I'm really looking forward to this Saturday next week. Just a final uh, comment um, before we uh, say goodbye to you today. Thanks again for coming back on. Philip Giraldi is our guest. The One of my concerns was that when the US realised, and of course its allies in the UK and France, and when they realised that they couldn't depose Bashar al-Assad, I was worried for a while there a couple of years ago that they would try and partition the, the country, which I think was on the table, but they failed to do that, which is um, which is great. It really is great. The Iran question, just very finally, Philip, in the last couple of minutes, um, that's obviously going to be up for debate as well. Russia, you would expect, would defend, would want to defend Iran and would want to dissuade the Zionist state of Israel from pushing and pushing and pushing where there might be a conflict with Iran. I don't think Iran has any serious ambition to develop a nuclear weapon. The Israelis keep telling lies about that. Do you think that will, will, will that be on the table on Monday or will that be further down the agenda, the Iran situation? Well, I think the Iran situation will definitely be part of the Syrian discussion. I think that the, um, uh, the Russians, there are certain indications that the Russians will be willing to work with the Iranians to avoid uh, any possible provocations from the Israelis. Now, that would mean basically keeping Iranian militia units uh, as far away as possible from the border with Israel. Uh, so that kind of makes sense. I mean, so it's a way of, uh, of uh, preempting any kind of problems. And I, I expect that that's going to be an issue to come up because obviously um, Russia has a good relationship with Iran. Uh, has a good relationship uh, with all the players in the situation, uh, except and even including Israel. Uh, the uh, the Russians can be a, a central player to keep this uh, situation from heading towards what you just described as a, some kind of partition of Syria. That isn't going to happen. 
Not now anyway. Philip, thanks again for giving us your time uh, today. We love having you on the show. Great writing, great work that you're doing. Again, I have put links out on my Twitter page and I will get them to uh, Facebook as well. Uh, many of our listeners know all about you anyway. But for those who don't, uh, you've got to read Philip Giraldi. Have a great weekend, Philip. Enjoy the rest of the summer and it'll be nice to catch up with you again in the fall. I know you're a busy man, you're travelling a lot, but um, let's catch up in the fall when the kids are back in school. Thanks again. OK, thank you. Great stuff. Uh, Philip Giraldi live on the line to estate from his home. Great stuff. Great to have him back on uh, the show today. It's exactly 10 minutes to the top of the hour. Time for a quick break. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www www.markbayerski.com It could just change your life forever. 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 Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. The Richie Allen Show relies on your support. Go to richieallen.co.uk and set up a monthly donation today. And it's eight minutes to five this Friday, 13th. TH is the 13th. I was hammered the other day on Twitter for speaking about Thailand and calling it Thailand. Got laughed at. I can take it when I deserve it. I've talked before about the THs. I won't get into it again. But we used to get battered. Presenters, we used to get battered by our superiors when they were critiquing our programmes. You've got to pronounce your THs. So now everything with a TH is pronounced the. Even Theresa May. This one I don't get though. It's spelled T H E R E S A. Theresa. Theresa, right? We would say. But they pronounce the TH a hard T. So it's Theresa May. I don't know. Anyway, it's not that important, is it? Is it? Hope you've got something good lined up for the weekend. I hope you do. It's going to be a scorcher, they're saying. It might be the last of the heatwave we've been enjoying. Saturday, Sunday, supposed to be absolutely scorching. My Saturday is going to be the laziest MF of a Saturday that I've ever had in my entire life. England, England, I tells you play the second one-day international cricket match against India. It's at Lords. It's on television. It starts at 11 o'clock tomorrow. And I'm going to sit my big derriere on my sofa in my man cave. And I'm going to spread out and watch the cricket all day long. The phone will be off. Computers will be off. Nothing else. Just me and the cricket. There you are. That's what I'm going to do tomorrow. And of course, Sunday View... We'll be live on Sunday morning at 11am as usual, where I'll be looking over the front pages of the Sunday newspapers. Right. Don't know what Sunday View is going to be like, because it seems that the papers are going to be full of the Trump visit to the UK, which um, carries on, really, into tomorrow, doesn't it? And uh, Sunday. Here's a story, dear listener, just before we go. Johnson & Johnson, massive company, massive corporation, has been ordered to pay $4.7 billion in damages to 22 women who had alleged that the talc products caused them to develop ovarian cancer. 
A jury in Missouri initially awarded $550 million in compensation and added $4.1 billion in punitive damages. The verdict comes as the pharmaceutical giant battles 9,000 legal cases involving its signature baby powder. Johnson & Johnson says it's deeply disappointed and plans to appeal. $550 million in compensation and $4.1 billion in punitive damages. Hey, eh? hey, massive that. It'll be reduced on appeal though. How do you know, Richie? Richie, you think you know everything. I don't really. But I followed a lot of these cases, these mass tort cases over the years. Generally, they get reduced on appeal to something a little bit more sensible. At least according to the judge that will hear the appeal. But it'll still be a big uh, verdict anyway. And I wonder, dear listener, a lot of women must be absolutely nervous at the very least anyway. Women who've used Johnson & Johnson talcum powder, talc powder products over the years. They must be thinking, Jesus, um, you know, it could be me. Anyway, I don't know. Right, you know what we're going to do? We're going to say goodbye to one another. We're going to say goodbye. Um, future Mrs. Allen has been in um, Budapest since last Sunday with her company on business. Uh, she doesn't own a company. She works for a company. And she's back this evening. I'm looking forward to picking her up at the old airport there. Big soppy guy that I am. So, yeah, picking her up later on. And as I said then, uh, cricket for me tomorrow, Sunday View Sunday. And I've got some good guests booked in for next week. Gilad Atzman will be on the programme uh, on Monday. That's going to be very interesting. Don't miss that. Uh, the author and broadcaster and, of course, legendary saxophonist Gilad Atzman will be on the programme this coming Monday as well. And I did mention to you a week or so ago that I've been putting some plans together to delve into the supernatural and the esoteric and the spiritual and the spiritual in the summer and we're, we're going to see some of that on the programme next, next week I promise you because I'm desperately keen to get into that because it's an area of interest for me and it's something that I know very little about you know that when you hear me interviewing people talking about the um, you know the nature of reality and stuff like that so we will be getting more of that in the week we'll, we'll have more news in hour one and we'll have guests talking about the spiritual and the ethereal and the other dimension and all that sort of stuff in the second hours of the programme look after yourself get away from your phone your tablet and all of that for the weekend enjoy the summer enjoy the weather and do join me for Sunday View at 11 on Sunday until then Here's Bruce the Boss Springsteen. And this is No Surrenders. Big to you Sunday. Bye.